So welcome everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Davina Stanley and I'm the founder of Clarity First Program. Um, so I teach people to communicate complex ideas. And I have with me today, Matt Lohmeyer. And Matt and I've had some terrific conversations, which is why I invited him to have this conversation to, well, so I can learn more from him as well. And he, when he and I met the first time through our publisher, actually, um, mm. we, were, we were talking about the link between communication and negotiation. And some of the people in my program, and I was a bit nervous to say this to Matt, tell me that part of what we do is negotiation. And what we're doing really is just understanding our audience and setting our communication up to head in a direction that is helpful and constructive, but also there's that idea of shepherding a piece of communication through a decision-making chain, and that's negotiation too. So there's a couple of sides to that, but I would say compared to what Matt does, the stuff that I do is just tiny in comparison around negotiation. He's got such a wealth of ideas to share. And so uh, Matt is the founder of Negotiation Partners, and he has been doing this negotiation skills training. It's what he's really passionate about for a very long time. Um, yes, let me um, welcome all. Uh, it's, um, I'm delighted to be here and thank you for the invitation, Davina. Um, we, uh, we had a truly interesting lunch and uh, it could have gone on for a lot longer, but that's chiefly, I think, because when it comes to negotiating, I'm happy to talk underwater. Um, let me say a couple of words uh, just about my background so you know where I'm coming from. And, and how I come to be here. My name is Matt Lohmeyer, and uh, I work as a professional negotiator. And when you tell people this, it's kind of, uh, it's almost like a bit embarrassing. You know, they kind of think you kind of, you know, strangle people across the table or anything like that. Um, my background, um, I'm actually a, a scientist by training. I did my PhD in postdoc in cancer drug development, and then uh, fairly soon defected to the dark side and started working in the pharmaceutical and biotech industries in what's called pharmaceutical licensing. So that's taking brand new drugs, brand new technologies, diagnostic technologies that have been developed at universities and research institutes and finding commercial partners for this, people who will be prepared to you know, invest hundreds of um, millions of dollars to uh, develop a drug. So, you know, hopefully one day will cure cancer or make an impact in diabetes or Parkinson's disease or whatever uh, area of, of research. And that was my, my life um, for in the first part of the career. I came to Australia in 2000. I'm German by birth and upbringing. Um, the only reason I say that is that because uh, if, if some of you find what I say a little bit structured, at least you know where that's coming from, right? Um, I like process. Um, and uh, I uh, started working here in Australia um, at the University of New South Wales. I was Associate Director of Medicine and Life Sciences. I worked at the CSIRO at their corporate transactions team, doing everything from licensing prawn farms to suing Microsoft and Apple for infringement of Wi-Fi patents and all sorts of fun negotiations. Um, but um, I wouldn't have called myself a professional negotiator back then. Um, why? Because I was just a person doing a regular job, negotiating as you all do uh, in your business lives and having much the same challenges and asking the same questions as uh, many of you have asked when, you know, we've asked you what sort of, you know, are your challenges coming back? Um, when did I change careers? It's when I did a course. I did a, a negotiation skills course, probably the third or fourth I did all through my career. Um, but that one was different because it wasn't run by a bunch of academics or by some lawyers or by people who'd read a book and you know, got themselves a slide set. It was run by two people who actually negotiated for a living, who are professional negotiators. And uh, I can tell you, I went into that program thinking, yeah, you know, pick up one or two things, maybe much the same thoughts that you're having here today. You know, maybe my learn one or two things, it'd be a good thing. I kind of know what I'm doing. Uh, I came out of that program, it was a three and a half day program. I came out of that program thinking, Matt, you've got no idea what you're doing. None. It caused me to revisit what I do from the ground up. Uh, a few months later, I decided to resign 
and train as a professional negotiator because I'd just seen a completely different way of doing this. Um, and that was 15 years ago. So as Davina said, I've been working as a negotiator, negotiating on behalf of clients. So I do work for government departments, Department of Defense, um, some large clients, some SMEs to help them negotiate with, you know, the big ugly gorillas out there that they need to deal with. Um, my team and I help clients prepare for negotiations and we teach. So the teaching part is, you know, one of three things that we do commercially. And um, I'm in the process and was introduced to Davina through um, a, a publishing agent and so we met and I just wanted to find out a little bit more about what she does and we had a very animated and very interesting conversation uh, and this is how we come to be here. Um, yes. yes and your background is is fabulous I think you you bring such you know intelligence to the work but also the the practical experience on both sides around doing the work yourself without necessarily having that specific negotiation skills training and then obviously falling in love with the method and and, and teaching it and sort of this this whole sort of gateway drug of never say no was a really fabulous one it was played on somebody did it to me last week and I went oh my goodness they used Matt's strategy no surprise, they're a CEO, they know what's up, right? But wow, that was really effective. I had to make the choice. Was I going to cancel my workshop and re rebook my flight in order to have coffee with this person? Or was I going to say, well, maybe next time I'm in town? The choice was mine. So he didn't say no at all. He made an offer that he was pretty sure I couldn't accept. Or I had to, re you know, make some big changes in order to accept. And so tell us a bit more about that, Matt. That was a real, I think, confidence giver for me when you described this technique. Yeah, it's uh, so often people associate negotiating with, um, you know, a bit of a bun fight, a struggle, uh, uh, you know, a wrestling for resources with the other side. And uh, one of the first things that we do when we teach participants on our program or when we work with clients uh, on transactions is to try and think about negotiations not in the way that most people do you know I'm going to deny you something that you want because it costs me something the mindset of the way that we look at negotiation is a much more positive one that if there's something that you need my job is to figure out how I can help you with that. Because the more I can help you, the more I can address your needs, the more good things I can do for you effectively, the more I can ask for in return for doing that, something that is of value to me. And so it becomes a process not of denying you and saying no, but a process of thinking about how can I say yes? On what terms can I give you what it is you want. And that's like a 180 degree different way of looking at negotiations. It becomes an enabling process, a process where you're trying to say yes, mm. uh, rather than saying no to the other side as being the default. And I think I certainly can think of experiences where I've been in that sort of discussion with people, let's call it a discussion, <laughs> where it becomes binary very quickly. And as soon as that happens, it becomes very difficult, doesn't it? It's a yes or no, and your, your heads are locked, and suddenly you've got a very difficult place to get out of. And I don't mean to speak for everyone else here, but certainly for me, that idea that, um, that I don't have to worry about getting into that place. I can pause and think about how to make that work rather than saying no, I think, at least enables me, it gives me a lot of freedom, I think, in those sorts of conversations. Yeah. So I thought that was enormously powerful. But um, we have some other things to talk about today too, don't we? We had some myths. Matt gave me a very long list of myths. And I said, well, let's pick three. And so we went, he just gave me this great shopping list. I think there must be, I don't know, 15 podcasts in this. So we went through and picked out um, the three that we thought would be most useful and so we'll encourage all of you just to pop the chat open so we can use yeah. that along the side 
And um, if you're not sure where that is, because you don't use Zoom much, it's along the bottom panel, just under uh, what is probably Matt's face, um, you'll see some buttons and one of them will be chat. So pop that open and then tell us this, when you negotiate, do you like to aim for a win-win outcome? Yes or no? Yeah. Pop in the chat. Just if you want to put it in, in the chat, see, see how you, uh, you know, is win-win, is win-win something that you're looking for, Richard? Okay, that's great. We've got a pretty unanimous yes here. Oh. And is there a cultural overlay, Simon? I see you're, you're calling in from Seoul. Then that's that's different. And <laughs> Mary. yes, except when with a nine-year-old. Ah, and yes. Well, don't get me started about negotiating at home. Yes. Um, <laughs> One of our possible titles for this discussion, I think, was something about how to how to win a negotiation with your six-year-old. So I think there's something to that. I think there's something to that, Tess. Okay. So, Matt, what do you oh. think? Should you go for a win-win or no? Fascinating. I think I'm a bit selfish, says Mary. Yes. Um, what do you mean by that? That's not, that's not quite a yes or no answer to the question, Mary. What are you thinking? Just unmute yourself and tell us. I'm, um, I'm looking out for myself first. So if I can accommodate someone else, that's okay. But if I can't, I'm pushing for what I want. <laughs> so I'm... Um, you say that... I'm not, I'm not saying no. I'm not saying no. I don't, I'm, I'm not <laughs> looking for a win-win. On the other hand, it's not my first priority. Yes. And, and you say this almost as if it was an apology. Yes. Um, and I want you to feel comfortable about looking out for your own because that's why you're there, right? That's <laughs> why you're there. And people often think, and this is at the heart of what a lot of people feel about negotiating, is that somehow if I get what I want, by definition, you must be getting less of what you want, right? And we feel a little bit awkward about that. Um, the phrase win-win itself is very old. It's, it was coined in the 60s um, by a chap called David Singer who was looking at game theory and the kind of non-zero sum games where, you know, um, as, as, you know, Mary sort of hinted at, you know, if I win some by definition, you must lose some. You know, if, you're, if we're haggling over the price of a, you know, uh, a second-hand car, you know, the more I, you, the, the more I get for on price, the more, you know, there's a, there's a sort of uh, a, a definitely a win-lose kind of scenario set up. Uh, is win-win something we should aim for? I'm a little bit, and I say this at the start when, when I work with a new team of people on a program, I'm a bit allergic to the phrase win-win, not because... I don't want the other side to win. I don't want the other side to have a good outcome. That's not why I'm allergic to it. It's because people use the phrase win-win in a way that causes it to mean it's a good deal for both sides. And that's not the same thing. A win-win doesn't mean you have a good deal. And as a professional negotiator, my job is to create good deals for both sides. So win-win doesn't describe that. Let me explain why. Imagine for a moment you're in a, in a sort of win-lose scenario, right? So you've got a lot and the other side is still losing. You might say, look, let's make this a little bit fairer. I'm adding a little bit more value into the deal. I'm giving them a little bit more. Okay. So it's still win or lose, but they're losing a little bit less. You following me? Yeah. And maybe you add a little bit more value. So it's still win lose for you. They're kind of closer to that mag imaginary line where might, somebody might call it a win win. And then you add a little bit more. And at that point, the deal turns from win lose into, you know, a win win deal, something that can be called a win win deal. Right? And you go, brilliant. Fabulous. We've got a win-win deal. We're all done. I've got what it is I want, and the other side has got just enough to justify the deal as a win. Is that a good outcome for both sides? Not really. 
What about all that other opportunity that was there? Why not aim for a deal that delivers me a big win, like a really big win, and that delivers a really big win for the other side rather than just being barely across the line? Yeah, all of that is win-win. There's a large spectrum. I want you to think well beyond win-win. You know, that imaginary line where a deal is just good enough to be called win-win. So to Imagine, ask you about yeah. that, Matt, are you saying that part of the game is not to be thinking about the immediate obvious things in front of you and saying you're splitting them in half in effect, but yeah. actually stepping back and looking at a much greater realm of possibility. So if we're thinking in a thinking sense and that consulting acronym MISI comes to play, yeah. no gaps, no overlaps. Well, no um, overlaps in the ideas, sure, but no gaps. If you're looking at the wrong world, there are gaps, you know, there's that different idea of where's the gap between the things you're looking at, or is the whole world that you're looking at big enough? Is it complete? So yeah. I, I hear a sense of that in what you're saying there. Is, is that a fair understanding? Yes. You've got to think beyond the, the variables that you're fighting over. You know, if you're buying something, um, you know, you're buying a car, and you're haggling over price, um, that's, you know, uh, that's zero sum. That's like the more I pay for the car, um, you know, the, the worse I'm off in terms of losing money and the more money that you make. Is there something else that we can add into the negotiation, into the conversation that gives me a better deal on the car, more variables, that gives me a better deal on the car, ideally something that's easy for you to do? low cost for you to do and high value for me. So, you know, fitting some accessories that might be cheap and easy for the dealership to do and that have high value for me. Is there something that I can do for the dealer? You know, maybe refer somebody who I know is in the market for a, you know, for a car, not refer them to the dealership, but to that particular salesperson that I'm dealing with. How much is that worth to them in terms of, you know, cutting me a better deal by adding something else into the game. So widening your gaze beyond the obvious and including other elements of value so that we can create a better deal than just, I bought a car for a good price. You know, it was, it was okay. At least I got a car. And is it also then about understanding the motivations of the other party? What really matters to the car dealer is to obviously have a thriving business and a thriving reputation perhaps so perhaps there yeah. are you know i commit to telling my people on my mailing list or whatever it is in my network um how what a great experience that i've had with you would that be useful to you or other things that might be useful to them as a person rather than just that single immediate transaction mm. yeah. when i bought my last car um, I went to uh, a lot of the different dealerships around where I live in Sydney. Um, I had a chat with more than one salesperson in each dealership. Um, it was the 28th of June, which is not a bad uh, day to buy a car. Timing. And um, I was looking for the salesperson who'd done the worst <laughs> through the year, right? I was looking for the worst salesperson in each car dealership. Look, maybe I, I, I negotiate, maybe I like it a little bit too much, but I enjoy this sort of thing, right? Um, and, and when you find the worst salesperson, you know, you're looking for the person who's most motivated to sell you a car, right? And one of the things I said to the salesperson when I found somebody, I thought, yeah, you might, you know, you're motivated to sell me a car and, and, and a, a good value deal. One of the things I said was, look, I'm, I'm happy to write you a personal letter of recommendation to your manager about, you know, how well I felt looked after and everything else. Because I got a sense when I spoke with him that, you know, maybe he was, um, you know, not doing so well on his performance review. And I thought I'd do him a favor. I'll write him a letter. Um, he was very grateful. Um, and I was very happy to have a tow bar. So, you know, that trade worked out very well for us both. Um, and that's why just thinking about, yeah, you know, I kind of got what I wanted and, you know, we, we both kind of got what I wanted is not for me the definition of a good deal. The definition of a good deal is well beyond win-win. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah, so often in commerce, I hear the words win-win almost as an excuse. You know, it was a tough negotiation and, you know, we, we came away, you know, bleeding a little bit. But, you know, I mean, you know, the other side needed a win too, so we got a win-win deal. That's almost an excuse for a poor negotiation. And so, you know, this notion that win-win is enough is, is, um, is one that, I, like I said, I'm a bit allergic to. Yes, yes, you think there's a lot of value being left on the table for both parties. But Absolutely, yeah. yeah. If win-win is all you're aiming for, you're aiming too low. It's, a, and it's an excuse for mediocrity as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. No, very, very interesting. And so there was our, our second myth. So let's lead with a question. Who has read the book Split the Difference by Chris Voss? Or Never Split the Difference, in oh, fact. Never Split the Difference. My apologies, I missed a critical <laughs> word. That's an important word. Yeah, very, very critical word. Um, let's just pop in the chat. Um, have you read that book? I confess I've started it, but not finished it. So it's on my very extensive list of books. Ah, Alexandra's read it. We've got here lots of no's. Started, not finished. Uh -huh. Aha, yeah. Richard, why did you start it and not finished? Is it just you haven't had time or what happened? Yeah, basically just got distracted. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. No, me too, me too. So tell us, you're, you're, you've got a different assertion here, Matt, that, um, you know, we should well, split the difference. Um, like most things, um, when you're negotiating, negotiation is all about flexibility. So words like never, I don't think have a, have a, uh, are, are a good place to start. When you're, when you're negotiating because never is limiting. If you say, well, never do this, then um, splitting the difference is just one technique. There are a whole range of different techniques that you can use in negotiating. In fact, um, we distinguish nine different techniques when you're negotiating, ways to resolve conflict. And they can be anything from imposing your will and saying, I'm sorry, this is where we need to go. Uh, that includes imposing contract terms and penalty clauses, for example. You know, um, if you're expecting a delivery and they haven't delivered, you can impose your will and, and uh, you know, send them an invoice for the agreed, you know, penalty. Um, or you could choose to compromise. You could choose to let it go. You could choose to problem solve. There are a whole range of different ways in which you can resolve conflict. And um, splitting the difference, compromise, haggling, they're the same thing. Um, I, I just one. Now, I'm not, no, I'm not saying I'm a great fan of splitting the difference. I'm not. Because what happens when you're splitting the difference, really, um, you're typically you're fighting over one thing. Often it's money. When you're negotiating with your children, it might be time you know, bedtime, playtime, computer time. Uh, commercially, sometimes it's time. And so, you know, somebody has one view, somebody has another view, and we're fighting over where we split the difference. And, you know, we're getting a bit closer and a bit closer. And then somebody says, look, let's go 50-50. And, you know, we, we agree. What's the problem with splitting the difference? The problem with splitting the difference is that typically neither side is really happy with the outcome. You know, I'm still paying a little bit more than I was planning to pay. Uh, you know, you're still getting a little bit less than you actually wanted. Uh, you know, both sides tend to leave a bit unhappy. So that's a good reason for not splitting the difference. But that's not a good reason for never splitting the difference. As because as splitting in the cat here, it's appropriate if it's a chocolate bar you're splitting. <laughs> well, uh, right. Um, and and um, splitting the difference has some advantages. It can seem fair if there is, you know, if but neither side is really particularly attached to that variable. Um, it's also quick. So if you're looking to split the difference and the other side says yes, you're done. So if time is of the essence and you really don't have a lot of time to negotiate and finesse and trade lots of variables, and you don't have 
power on your side so you can't tell the other side just to impose your will and say jump right uh sometimes splitting the difference can be a quick way forward that is not perfect it doesn't optimize the deal but at least it gets it done quickly so as one of nine different techniques i you know i, I certainly can't support never to split the difference i'd always prefer to negotiate or problem solve or persuade through good coherent argument through laying out as uh, davina uh, teachers laying out your strategy and laying out, a, you know, a persuasive path forward. But you know what, if you only have two minutes, sometimes you need to split the difference and just move on. So getting a fast uh, outcome rather than forgetting necessarily an optimal outcome. Yes, because if time is more valuable than, you know, a couple of dollars that you might make one way or the other, let's go for time and pace rather than optimizing dollars, which is not where the value is. So that's also about being strategic about your negotiation, isn't it? Thinking about the things that are perhaps, certainly the whole thing, if, if, if the whole thing has to be fast, but yeah. if there's components of the thing that you think actually there's much bigger and more important things for us to worry about. And these smaller things are going to get in the way and, and derail us. And somebody in their notes talked about rabbit holes. I think that's probably an example. Yeah of a technique for cutting off those rabbit holes that you see people about to go down. It's like, right, let's sort this bit out so we can leave it and move on to the real thing. So yeah. you're saying there's a time and a place for it, but it's just that it's not your preferred method for certainly the big part, the strategic part of your negotiation. Absolutely. And it's, it's a game of skill and it's a game of being able to use those nine different tools, those nine different techniques, you know, where appropriate. Yes. Um, and um, at the end of today, I think we've arranged an opportunity uh, for those who are interested to um, have a bit of a look at what their preferred techniques are. But we'll get back to that for those who yes. can hang uh, for um, hang on to the end of uh, the program, the workshop. No, we will. And um, so I think that's that's a really good point to think about our last uh myth as well where we were talking about you know it's it's always about win-win maybe not uh never split the difference well be strategic about when you split the difference and perhaps how and what you split the difference on so mm -hmm. i think they're the first two the last one let's just test when do you think you should focus with the, on the easy things in a negotiation at the beginning at the middle or the end? When should you deal with the easy things? You could flip that question either way, couldn't you, Matt? Yeah. But let's see. Let's just. Most, most negotiations will have something that I call the hairy beast, right? The really tough mm -hmm. stuff, right? Uh, do you leave that till last? Do you deal with the tough stuff in the middle? Do you do the tough stuff early? So, um, We've got uh, D Hachi six. He says, "Do the easy stuff early." What's the vibe in the room? When do we do the easy stuff? Do we tidy it up at the end or get it done early? We've only got the one. So Darren's given us a few. I suspect in, I know a little bit about Darren's role too. I think he negotiates quite a bit, actually, in his role. That would be my guess. Okay, we've got a couple of earlies now. I sense some hesitation though, Matt. <laughs> I see when people are really confident, they tend to respond to these sorts of questions very yeah. quickly. So I'm, I'm sensing a bit of thinking. And what have we got here? Depends on the relationship. If the relationship is good, put the dead cat on the first the table, table first. on the table first. <laughs> Sometimes sandwich between the easy things. Oh my gosh, Alexandra, that's lovely. That's a, yeah, that's a that's that's a lovely image, isn't it, Alexandra? A dead cat sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got depends on the relationship and like the bread in a, in a love sandwich. Go love for it, Matt. Image. Tell us what you think. Um, we have a we have a rule. And, and it's a very simple rule. Always deal with a hairy beast first. And actually it doesn't, you, you'd think it might depend on the relationship, um, but actually experience shows that that's less of an issue. Deal with the hairy beasts first. Why? There are a couple of different reasons. Because if you have a, if you have a hairy beast, 
you know, something that is really tricky that you know is going to be ugly to negotiate. Sometimes in a major negotiation, perhaps there is no meeting of minds on that hairy beast issue. You know, uh, we will never accept uh, these warranties and liabilities. And the other side goes, we never do a deal without them. And the lawyers have it at 10 paces and there is no deal to be done. Nobody is prepared to, to move on those. And so there is no deal to be done. And if there is no deal to be done, you want to know this at the beginning, don't you? Rather than three months into a heavy duty negotiation. And at the end, you say, what about those warranties and liabilities? And then you find out that all your work was in vain. So that's one reason for dealing with a hairy beast first, because sometimes there is no deal to be done. And you might as well figure this out right at the start. The other reason why I think you should deal with the hairy beasts first is because if you manage to get the hairy beasts sorted, you know, with you know, a bit of negotiation and some judicious trading, there might be some things that you know you need to compromise on that you might need to um, you know, uh, add to the mix in order to get that hairy beast across the line. But then after that, the negotiation becomes a lot easier, doesn't it? Because the big ugly stuff is done. And, you know, from then on, it gets easier and easier and easier. That's less important when you're negotiating a one-off deal like buying a car. But most of you, and judging from the questions, a lot of you are thinking about negotiations in the context of long-term relationships, either internally at work or with long-term clients, long-term business partners, that sort of thing. And so in those kind of negotiations, it's great when the negotiation becomes easier as you go through. And then at the end, you're just mopping up the small fry, right? And then you sign the deal and everybody goes, yeah, well done. Whereas if you deal with the hairy beasts last, what happens? You do all the easy stuff first. And then right at the end, you go, damn, price. Or, you know, whatever the hairy beast is. And then it becomes a really ugly haggle and a compromise. And even if you do get the deal across the line, everybody's feeling a bit bruised and battered. And you sign this damn thing and everybody's really not enthusiastic and go away, you know. Hey, hey, let's go with the five-year relationship, you know, and everybody's feeling... Can I play devil's advocate for a minute? And Go for it. A number of questions coming through about what happens if they're early, you know, some of the easy issues help build trust and empathy. What happens if you've got some smaller issues that you think are no-brainers, that you're really confident the other side is also going to say yes, yes to? What about doing just a couple of those to build momentum and then dive into the hairy beast? You, you said before about being binary, you know, with the never split the difference. Do you always go with the hairy beast first or do you sometimes do a little bit first to just really build that rapport, particularly with a new pros you know, new person you're negotiating with? Well, and Davina, you've got me there because or... it's never, never and it's never always. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but let me just reflect on the general principle. You know, if there's something that is a no brainer for both sides, it probably doesn't actually need negotiating. You know, it probably just needs ticking off. Um, the problem with doing some of those easy things first is often with those easy, easy things, there's a lot of room to move. That's what makes them easy, right? So if you think about those easy things as variables, as bargaining chips, if you like. So if you settle all those easy things, you're actually removing bargaining chips from the table because they're sorted. And then you get to the hairy beast and that's when you want a lot of flexibility, except you've already taken a lot of the flexibility that you had on those easy things off the table because they're sorted. So be very careful with the number of easy things that you do first. Yes. To settle because, down and build. All right. So are there other ways of building rapport and, you know, making sure that you move away from that sense of confrontation that could come? Yeah. You know, tackling the hairy beast first. What are, what are the other strategies to warm up the cold room before you <laughs> dive on the hairy beast? I have never found it a problem when you say to 
the person across the table. I think the most difficult challenge we're going to have with this is clause five. Which one, I mean, that's the way I'm thinking at it. Which one do you think we're going to have the most trouble with at your end? And sometimes it's going to be quite surprising. Sometimes they say, well, actually, clause five will be fine. No, we're okay with that. Terrific. One big weight off my, off my shoulders. But even if the answer is no, I think clause five is going to be an issue. And by the way, clause 15 is going to be problematic too. Well, why don't we deal with those first and see how we go? That's the confrontational part is often in the language or in the mindset. Whereas you see, we approach negotiations, as I said, from a, from a position of let's find a way to say yes, rather than a confrontational mindset. And so being open to their challenges and seeing their challenges and demands as opportunities, not to deny them, but to enable them, um, and what you is a lot better a strategy than waiting with that nasty surprise until the end when they all thought they were done. And then suddenly you go, oh, by the way, <laughs> let me introduce you to the hairy beast. Now that's really going to destroy trust. So is what you're doing is getting agreement around the strategy, the negotiation strategy. That's what you're getting agreement on. So you're choosing to build rapport around style and, and tone, but also around, okay, how about we talk about the way we're going to handle this negotiation, getting agreement Absolutely. around that up front and then going and dealing with, and you're, I'm assuming, giving them flexibility to say, well, actually that's not my hairy beast my hairy beast is over here and then to actually say terrific let's deal with your hairy beast first is, is ah, that part of i would deal with them together because if you can help me solve my hairy beast maybe i can help you solve yours okay all right now we've got a question a comment here in the chat a couple of them so getting to yes says not getting the room nodding first and it sounds like matt's <laughs> strategy for that is getting them to agree around the meta strategy, the strategy for the negotiation rather yes. than, which I think it's really clever. Um, and Brian, um, that's, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with getting to yes, of course. Um, getting to yes, uh, probably one of the most famous books in negotiation uh, was written by a bunch of academics um, with a legal background. And academics have this wonderful way of thinking about negotiating in that if we could all be nice, you know, to each other and just, you know, give each other all this stuff, then the world will be a better place. And that's great if you're sitting across the table from people who, um, you know, have the same attitude, but that's not always the case. Yeah. And if you're in a commercial negotiation, you know, this idea of we'll just be nice and get them nodding and saying yes, and then suddenly by, as if by some magic, they won't insist on their liabilities and indemnities clause is just laughable, right? That people are not going to change what they want because, you know, you said the yes to them on a couple of minor issues. They'll have a sheet and it says exactly on that sheet what it is they want. Those numbers won't change because you've smiled at them or you've given them a little bit of stuff. That's fanciful, I'm afraid, um, in, in terms of you know, the psychology of it. There's a lot of psychobabble around negotiating, um, which just doesn't work. Um, and those of you who started reading uh, Never Split the Deference by Chris Foss, the first couple of chapters are terrific. Uh, and then he goes into, you know, mirroring and repeating the last three words of the previous sentence and all that kind of stuff. And that might be really helpful when you're talking somebody off a building. Uh, it will do nothing when you're negotiating with Woolworths you know, it doesn't change their demands, whether you repeat the last three words they said or not, you know, they're going to thump the table and they're going to tell you that if you don't drop your price, you'll be delisted from the store, uh, you know, or whatever, in the bad old days. Um, not want to cast aspersions on Woolworths or Coles or anyone else. Um, but there's a yeah, negotiation. The bad old days of cliffing, um, that's just not reality. That's yeah. you know, academics doing some contemplating. Sorry, Davina. No, no, that's that's really interesting. And I think understanding where authors of books are coming from is actually really powerful. And mm. 
working with people who've been in the trenches with you, I think is a really valuable thing to do, whatever you're doing. And I noticed here, Mary's put a comment as well, having been subjected to easy first and then bring the big problem, lose faith. I think that is actually a really big risk with leading yeah. later. It makes you feel as though you've been manipulated. At least I feel that way when I'm put in that position. And then we've got here, often the, the other party won't reveal openly what's their hairy beast. Okay, great point. Maybe going through the list of everything that needs to be negotiated all at once, first in the hope of having the other party reveal their hairy beast by reading their reactions and body language. Okay, talk to that because that's a really, there's a big assumption in, in that initial idea of agree the strategy. What if they won't? Good thought. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I, I like that. Um, you can't obviously make other people do anything they'll do whatever they think fit and if they think they want to hold on to the hairy beast um then that can be a problem but being proactive about your side can often encourage them to reveal theirs um what do you think will be the most challenging part of this negotiation you know is an open question and you're kind of inviting uh an open answer and typically you get a genuine answer and very rarely will people not tell you what the you know what the challenging issues are um and you can be open and say look um you know i'm hoping we can get these sorted first because you know we'll um explain to them maybe why it's in both sides interest to deal with the hairy beast first because it'll make the process much more efficient and, uh, you know, if we've solved the major issue, we can both go back to our bosses and say, I think the deal's on track. Whereas if we haven't, then, you know, we'll be uncertain for a lot longer. Um, negotiation is a little bit like, you know, somebody's got to be in control. Somebody's going to drive this car <laughs> that we call a negotiation. It can be you or it can be the other side. Um, look, I'd always prefer that, uh, you know, I, I know how well I can drive the car. So, you know, I'd rather I drove it than the other side drove it. Um, driving it together is always a bit problematic. You know, they steer to the right and you want to steer to the left. Um, put yourself in control uh, and manage the process. Work with the other side. Be open with the other side. Agree on the way forward on the strategy. Seek their input. But at some point, you know, somebody's going to get behind the wheel and it might as well be you. And terrific. That, that's, that was a great answer. I think that's, that's dealt with Simon. Thanks, Simon. Which was a really terrific one. And I think um, now is actually a really great time to put questions into the chat. And we have quite a, a great long <laughs> list of things that came through when people registered, which is why we ask for those questions in advance. And... Um, I'll put a question out there to open it up. What happens when people backpedal? So you, you think you've solved the hairy beast and you move on to the little tiny furry things that look cute. Um, what happens when they backpedal? What do you do? To some degree, I guess that depends on why they're backpedaling. Uh, sometimes okay. people have made a mistake, made a genuine mistake, miscalculated. Sometimes their boss has said, you know, you agreed what? Yes. Um, and uh, really, if they're going back on what's previously agreed, there's not really a lot that you can do because nothing's agreed until everything's agreed. So, um, you know, you might have the moral high ground, but that doesn't help you very much if the other side, you know, if the other side's boss says no, then, you know. Um, so you, you engage with it and you have to reopen the negotiation um on that issue and usually quite a few other things unravel as well you can try and make them feel bad about it uh and everything else but in the end um if it's no deal then it's no deal um the challenge is not to simply give in and let them get away with you know taking some value off the table and again this is where your skill will help you um because you'll you know you'll just have to trade um, value in different areas so that the deal retains the same value for you, but maybe in a slightly different package. Is it also about getting the right people in the room? Are there things that you can do in advance of, let's say, getting in the room, but getting into the negotiation that minimises that kind of risk? So if you don't have the actual decision maker in the room with you, 
or at least contactable to confirm a decision on the way through. You you run the very great risk of backpedaling and, and a great sort of yeah. mess, don't you? Talk to yeah, that's a great that. that's a great pickup, um, especially if it happens repeatedly, you know, when you're negotiating with people who, you know, at every turn have to run back to you know their lords and masters or whoever they have to run back to to get permission um then you're clearly not negotiating with the right person um and bringing the senior decision makers in the room would be a good strategy absolutely and how often have you ever paused a negotiation because you think you're getting you've had a couple of examples of that and absolutely. It, okay well perhaps it would be more constructive if we have those people in the room absolutely and couldn't that become a binary thing? Unless they're in the room, we're not going to proceed even. I mean, do you ever get to that point? Or how do you handle that? Um, again, you cannot impose how the other side wants to run the negotiation. And, you know, you might want to, you might love to negotiate with the CEO of BHP, but, you know, you're not going to get them in the room uh, to negotiate the deal. So um, there are some process ways in which you can, uh, ensure that the other side has enough time to have that regular consultation and encourage them to have a clear mandate. Um, unfortunately, you can't make them do it. That would be nice. Um, your so you know, negotiation, then perhaps to a degree, yes. And <laughs> to a degree, um, what you have control over is your own actions. And you might choose not to engage with the other side for a while until they have a clear mandate. So look, until you know you have a clear mandate to negotiate and you know what you can say yes or no to, we'll just put that on the back burner. I've got other deals to do. And you yes. know, give me a ring when when you know what it is you want. You yeah. wouldn't put it as bluntly as that, but you know, you have better things to do. Yes, yes. Brooke, I'm gonna come back to your question. Um, I think there's an interesting thing that's connected to what we've just been talking about there about having the influencers available to participate yes. in the in the negotiation. And they'll do that when they think it's really important enough for them. That's my assumption. So that's then about prioritization. And one of the questions that we had that came through was how can one influence higher ups, especially when a big problem is being ignored, which sounds to me like a negotiation. How do we raise something to a significant awareness that people do pay attention, come into the room for an actual negotiation or agree to deal with something. Yeah. What is I would say that? actually first that is probably in your ballpark, Davina, because the first part there is not so much a, persua a, a negotiation but a persuasion element. So actually structuring your thoughts, structuring uh, the proposal in a way that is compelling for the other side. Um, so that the other side has the best possible chance of grasping what it is you want and have that communication crystal clear. So and then when the other side comes back and says, hey, you know, we might have some budget constraints or we don't quite see it, that's when the, the, the pace and the conversation changes yes. to a negotiation. We say, okay, so what would it take for you to give this your full support? And now we're negotiating. And that's where we get to, isn't it, when we're shepherding an idea through an organisation, which is part of yeah. what, where I think this question's coming from. And the, the Houston, we have a problem story pattern is a terrific one to say, hey, we really have a problem. And here's why it's a problem. And building that case to be really clear about mm -hmm. that and really compelling. And there are a number of ways of structuring that story. So, okay, so that's about understanding your, you're calling them the other side, your stakeholders, who yeah. they are, understanding their drivers, understanding their motivators. And really, if you believe something is a real issue, then framing that and really doing your job and building your case to justify why it's a sufficient issue. So, okay, that's, that's, um, then, then you're opening up the negotiation around what I, I notice this language being used in tech clients a lot. I don't see it in other places, but I think it's very useful. And that's the discussion around trade offs. And there's mm -hmm. very often very explicit trade offs in tech because of the way you might design some code and the way you'll structure your architecture. So it becomes very concrete. I think mm -hmm. in a lot of other discussions, they're a little bit 
looser, it's, it's softer. So that term isn't used as much. But I think the concept can be quite useful. You know, so if, if, if what, how are we going to prioritize these things? How are we going to trade them off? What's yeah. the balance? How do we get the outcome that gets us a really great deal? You're, you're talking about going from an okay deal to a great deal. Yeah. How do we get a great deal? How do we do that? Yeah. All That's right. exactly at the heart of it. Finding value trades that create value for both sides. Yes, yes. And I'm, I'm coming back to Brooke's question now. Any resources we can recommend about using the right words when negotiating? Gosh, that's about as long and broad as it gets, doesn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> Brooke, what kind of words were you looking for? Words in terms of making proposals or words in terms of um, responding to the other side? She doesn't have a voice. Oh, okay, no I worries. Know. Yeah, so maybe pop some in, into the chat there, responding to the other side. Right, okay. Um, questions. Questions are a wonderful way and a very powerful way to respond uh, to the other side's demands, to the other side's proposals. Help me understand why that's important to you. Under what circumstances might you be prepared to do that for me? Um, good negotiators are good listeners and they ask lots of questions to really understand what's going on on the other side of the table um, with a view to helping them, with a view to understanding how we can create a better deal for the other side. And in so doing, creating a better deal, a richer deal, a higher value deal for your own side. And that's actually a very positive conversation rather than a, I'm not giving you this, or I wanna give you less, exactly. Yes. Um, how can I help you? What else can we do for you? Um, let me see whether this would work. Just suppose we were able to do that. What could you do for us in return? You know, those sort of questions, um, rather than statements, assertions, and you know, thumping the table can be a very powerful way. Um, that's also a great thing to segue into Brian's question. And I'm thinking about a negotiation experience I had as well, where he says, how do you move things forward if you're feeling bullied or played, the situation of unequal power? And so I'm gonna feed into that an extra piece, which is how do you move things forward where you feel like you're coming up against a brick wall? when you, you really are stuck, does the questioning help you unstick yourselves? Or, you know, I think being bullied feels a little bit binary like that too. How do you get yourself out of those sorts of circumstances? That really depends on the circumstance, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so uh, it's a very broad question. Yes. Um, let me answer it broadly. Um, if you're thinking about a commercial transaction, you know, and one party is, you know, really bullying their way to an outcome. Yes. Uh, we have a saying, uh, and we found this to be quite true. And it doesn't matter whether you're buying or selling. Uh, you know, we've worked with large supermarkets. We've worked with suppliers into the supermarkets. We work with pharma companies. We work with, um, you know, the Department of Health. Um, so, you know, both sides of the table, never at the same time, of course, but um, <laughs> on the same deal. But one thing we found pretty reliably is that usually both sides underestimate the power they have in negotiations. Mm -hmm. Typically, people underestimate the power they have in negotiations. And uh, if the other side is playing and being a bully, what is it that they want from you? Because there's a reason they're bullying you, right? Because you have something they want. Uh, and the more they bully you, I suspect, the more, the more, more desperate have. they are for getting what it is they want, because otherwise they'd bully somebody else, right? So you have something that they want. That gives you some power. Or maybe you can do something that they would wish to avoid. 
So is this sense of being backed against a wall or perhaps feeling squeezed or bullied or played, is that actually like, yes, um, that's well, a compliment in a way to reframe that and say, oh, I wonder it's, why it's a, yeah, How it, it's, interesting. It's not an easy space to get to, but once you understand how negotiations really work, the fact that people make demands of you, I think is terrific. The fact that people thump the table if they want something from you, I think it's terrific because what that tells me is that you really want what I have and you're quite agitated to get it. My job as a negotiator is just to not be bullied by that and to find a way to get something back in return that I value more highly than what you're asking me for. Right. So reframing that need and often with bullies is a desperate need um, is a good thing. Um, one other um, maybe um, calming thought, what I found reasonably reliably is people who are bullies um, often don't have another gear. Right. They go fast forward. And if fast forward isn't working. If you don't allow yourself to be bullied um, by holding your ground, being disciplined, asking questions, taking the heat out of that hole, you know, and not allowing you to sort of be seen to be on the back foot. What happens then is they don't know what to do because that's all they know how to do. That's how they win. You know, they bully people, they thump the table and they get what it is they want. And when that's not working, they're kind of, you know, I'm not sure what to do next because bullying people is not a great skill, whereas negotiation is all about skill. And, uh, and so the best way to deal with bullies is not to bully back, but actually to take the sting out of it. Think about it differently. The reason they're bullying you is because you have something they want. Um, what you need to do have the control to figure out what you want in return and be firm about trading that to them. And I know it's easier got, said than done. I appreciate that, but that's where the skill comes in. But also not being upset about not re reacting with emotion to their emotion. Cause I suspect yeah. once you start seeing, you know, the, the thump on the table, if it's a strategy, you can read through that, can't you? Yeah, you absolutely. Just, uh, you know, a, a, a performance. But if it's actually really felt, that's where you can see that actually there's, there's an issue here, yeah. that there's and something to be really talked about and to say, right, okay, so it looks like there's something that really matters to you. Yeah. Let, let's unpack that. And sometimes people bully out of fear and out of desperation rather than out of wishing to assert their power. And again, in that kind of context, uh, the approach of, how can I help you with that uh, is a very positive one rather than, you know, uh, punching them. Seeing Darren's note, they're really enjoying, but my boss's 9am meeting is not negotiable. <laughs> <laughs> that is fabulous. And look, I think we are probably at a really good point to, to close because we've covered an awful lot of ground. But if I were to draw out some themes, here, it, it seems to me that this is coming from a place of abundance and positive and, and let's find a wonderful solution, a great solution without being at all naive, but you know, let's have a great solution here rather than this head to head combative lose lose, which, yeah. you know, you, if you're focusing on win win, ironically, that's where you may not necessarily but may end up so we might take a bit of Jim Collins and say, let's let's see how we can go from good to great yeah. outcomes from negotiations by using some really smart um, strategies is, is what yeah. I'm hearing from you. And so thank you so much, Matt, um, for spending your time with us. I've loved hearing what you've got to say. And we do have some extra resources for people. And what I'm going to be doing is sending an email out um, from... Uh, to everyone who registered and, and those um, perhaps who might watch the recording later on and give a link to a diagnostic which um, Matt's really generously shared and um, I'm tell us Matt is that an anyone can do it is that a limited number limited time 
Um, anyone can do it. It's a diagnostic that we use as part of our program. Uh, we, um, um, it's uh, what that diagnostic will do if you complete it. It will tell you your preference for each of the nine different techniques that you can use in negotiations. Everyone has their unique fingerprint. And I might tell you a little bit about how you go about resolving conflict, and it'll have some advice about what you might do to raise your game uh, and maybe explore some of the techniques that are not front of mind for you. Um, it's part of the program that we teach, um, and uh, I've, um, we're in the process of developing the new version. Uh, so I thought I'd give you an opportunity to do that diagnostic and give me your feedback. How does that sound? No, that sounds that sounds really good. I'm very interested to do it. I'm curious, but also you've got a really detailed PDF, which is also a download. So I'm going to send around uh, an email that will take you to a web page, which will have the recording for those who perhaps might be listening on the recording, but also give you access to those downloads underneath that video so that you'll have full access to those. So thank you so much to your questions in advance and your questions and participation during um, the session. I've loved hearing where you're coming from and, and certainly have had great um, value from our conversation. Again, Matt, look out, we might have to have you back again sometime. It'll be a pleasure. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a terrific Friday, all.